Greetings and welcome to another Warhammer 40,000 Kill Team Tournament Report. This time I'll be going over my experience at the Bad Moon Cafe Tournament hosted last, sas well, last Sunday in London. But before we get into things, please remember to like and subscribe as well as comment about what you thought of the video and, well, my tournament experience and what else you'd like to see in the future for the channel. But yeah, today's video is just going to be me talking about how I faced in another tournament, because if you remember, my last one I played at was at Warhammer World in October, which was pretty much a month ago now, three weeks, something like that. So this time, the only difference will be we've still got the new FAQ and Errata in use, but this time there'll be Chownath kill teams in use. So the Novitiates and the Pathfinders. So yeah, let's get into it. Now for the event prep, so this is a Bad Moon Cafe tournament, but once again, it's not run by Bad Moon Cafe, it's hosted. So it was hosted by, well, it was run by the London Wargaming Guild, but hosted by Bad Moon Cafe, if that makes sense. And for tournament prep, I didn't really do much, partly because I didn't have much time, but also the event pack they were using was basically the same as the Warhammer World October Kill Team event, because they were using the same missions, printed in the same order. The only difference, it was a four missions, and the first mission was Seize Ground, and that was pretty much it. They they had some minor differences. So the biggest one was uh, you got to pick your tag ops because that's this is more of a ITC tournament, whereas uh, the Warhammer World, Warhammer World one just follows the book. So you know picking tag ops randomly picking them whatever for this tournament because I got to pick them I had a lot less pressure on my tag ops because I find it a bit easier because you can kind of game your tag ops when you can just pick them all the time but whatever it's an itc thing so like competitive hyper competitive play even though the warhammer World tournament is still very competitive and this is also going to be another 36 player tournament well yeah 36 because it's sold out so that was pretty much my event prep because nothing much had changed there wasn't really much to prep the biggest contention for me was it uses strength as schedule as the primary tiebreaker. Now at Kill Team at Warhammer World, it was based on wins, then total tag up scores and victory points. But at Bad Moon Cafe, it was wins, strength of schedule, then it was supposed to be tag up scored, but then they changed it on the day to total victory points scored. And while I get what strength of schedule is for, I really don't like it as a primary tiebreaker because it, because it's so outside of your control and it's just not great as a primary tiebreaker, like as a tertiary, like a secondary or third tiebreaker. I think that's fine, you know, but it's a bit of people are kind of getting too obsessed with how they do and how they are as a player because the people championing strength of schedule, strength of schedule as the primary tiebreaker are those who say like, I've, I'm a really good player and I played hard opponents, so I want my score to show that. But I'm more of the laid back attitude was like, whatever your results are, your results are. There's no really, you shouldn't go into a tournament going, I deserve this, or I played really hard, a hard opponents, so I should be placing higher. But it's just how I view things. And then we go on to tournament, well, kill team selection. So for my kill team, I thought about using the commandos, but I've already won with them. The pack is basically the Warhammer World pack, and because I pick my tack ops, I know what to do, and I've played against Pathfinders with them, and I'm pretty confident in dismantling Pathfinders. So I'm not saying oh I would have like automatically won if I took the commandos. It would have just been boring for me. <laughs> so because with commandos you get so much choice, so I get to plan out more, and with that kind of event I can just literally plan out everything. Because the other thing I forgot to mention is the terrain. So they were allowing players to bring their own terrain in because the terrain at Bad Moon isn't great because it's focused on 40k, so it's mostly just blocks, which isn't good for Kill Team. So I was predicting a high shooty benefit. So that's why I went with Pathfinders. But also I wanted to see how good they are because they're very strong on paper, but I wanted to see how well they would do in person because I'd only done one practice game with them. And before that, I'd played with them in the battle report. So technically I only played them twice. And I think if ever we was going to win or do really well with Pathfinders, it'd be in that tournament because you get to pick your tack ops. 
because they're locked into recon. And while they have some decent faction tac ops, when you're randomly selecting tac ops, especially for recon, it can kind of curtail what you do a lot. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to pick Pathfinders to see how they do because they don't actually suit how I play because they're very shooty and you can be aggressive with them, but not in melee. And I like having a mixed element to my list. So they don't have any good close combat. It's just guns. And while it's good at punishing how people play place their operatives, I kind of like a more mixed approach. So I'd be testing myself as well. And I thought it'd be more interesting for you guys to see me with a new kill team instead of just going, oh, look, it's commandos. I did exactly the same thing with my commandos and did really well. And that's pretty much it for the for the roster. So my roster was basically everything you get in Chownath. So a Shazui, all the specialists, and then a gun drone, marker drone, and recon drone. And for my weapon experts, I took two ion rifles because I always overcharge my iron rifles. It's really easy to get full rerolls either via the recon drones analyze or getting like four or five mark light tokens on someone. So I never see a reason not to overcharge with your iron rifle because then it goes to five dice, five slash six damage with AP one. Whereas the rail rifle was just four dice hitting on fours, decent damage, four slash four and lethal five up with mortal wounds two. But I just like rolling five dice because if you get five hits and your opponent has only two op opportunities to save, because that's either three to four damage or five damage going, well, five damage attacks going through, which could be anywhere from 25 to what was that, 30 damage because of that profile. So that's why I went with iron rifles. And also it's everything you build in the box. If I had a choice, I'd probably build two more normal pathfinders the other drones are pretty useless and as in like i can see uses for the shield drone but i don't really rate that and yeah that's pretty much it now i will say even though you can switch your roster around like for the kill team for the game every game i just went with the same loadout so it was generally it was my shazu my leader all the specialists and I only took one weapon ex were well, one weapon expert was just one iron rifle. And then I took the marker drone, gun drone, and recon drone. So the recon drone counts as two selections. I took the medic, because the medics that keep people alive. The interference specialist is really good because it can do minus one APL and he ignores obscuring. So he can do minus one APL to anyone within range. He has to have an engage order. But you ignore obscurium, so you can sit behind well more than one white away from an obscuring piece of terrain and still shoot freely, ignoring all the pieces of heavy. And then I've got the comms, drone controller, which is super important, the sniper expert, and what was it, grenadier? Always say the grenadier. I think that's, yeah, all the specialists you can build. So if you just buy Chow Enough once, you can do everything I did. The reason I only took one weapon expert is because I found two not great, and I liked having that additional marker light. And for the equipment, I generally picked uh, the targeting enhancement, which gives you plus one marker light token when you're shooting at someone to marker light. So I gave that to my sniper expert and the iron rifle. So when they were shooting at someone, they counted as having plus one. So if someone had four marker light tokens, they would count as having five. And then I took enhanced uh, marker light on my leader, on my comms, and also my, uh, what do you call it, blooded pathfinder. So that, that's all I took. I didn't really change much. It was if I against was against more elite opponents or something, I'd change up a bit, but that's what I use every game in this tournament. Oh, and another thing for my Tau Pathfinders, I also for marker light tokens, I use some acrylic ones. So I got these from counterattack bases if you're interested. They're mainly for 40k, but they work perfectly fine for kill team. So I bought the five for 20. Uh, so 20 marker light tokens for five pounds. And you can find that down in the episode description. That's what I used. You don't really need to color them in, you can, but they look perfectly clear fine. I went with the clear cosmic blue, but I use them and they're pretty useful. So if you're interested in using them as marker light tokens, I'd highly recommend them. So game one was Seize Ground against uh, my opponent, I forgot his name, Paulo, Paolo, I think. And he was using Novitiates. So this is gonna be an interesting game because originally it was quite thematic. Now you see on the board that there are two skulls and those basically block out those terrain pieces. Because they were, uh, they provided terrain maps, which I'll show on the board now. Well, on the on the screen now. So they showed how the board should look if you're playing on an Octarius board, because there were 18 boards and 12 of them had Octarius terrain. Now the weird thing about this is 
if you played on your board, you stayed on it, which I get, but we'll get to that later. So that obviously this was all Paolo's terrain. And yeah, so I was the attacker, made him set up first. He, he went up top. So most of his forces were behind the central terrain piece with about f uh, two on the left side. And what happened this game was effectively, it was very static. So game, for turning point one, he moved his Chalice Lady first onto the right objective on his side. And I mark her up and immediately killed her. So he went up to six faith points, but I knew playing against her, I needed to eliminate her. So I already curtailed his faith point generation there. Then his marksman lady with the crossbow moved up on top, shot someone, and then got mark up and died. And then I just feel, failed to kill uh, an operative on the right-hand side to stop him controlling that objective. Because with seize ground, you have to control an objective at the end of a turning point to score. But I only lost, lost like one operative, I think. I was doing pretty well. My tac ops were uh, mark enemy movements and then plant signal beacon. And I forget the last one because, spoilers, I didn't score it. Um, oh, what was it? I think it was... Oh, right, I'll go on. But anyway, so it was actually fairly even. What I underestimated, because at turning point one, I basically shot apart all his melee specialists but then I underestimated his flamers. So he managed to get a flamer forward on turning point two and use the stratagem to make it three slash four damage because I didn't realize, I realize it was two slash three. So anything I shot at, it killed. Um, but effectively, I managed to neuter his sniper and then effectively kept killing off his melee specialists, but I wasn't able to control the points. So we were basically neck and neck and we were neck and neck on tac ops as well. And then via the end... So this is the, we thought it was an hour and 45, but then we only found out it was an hour and a half. So we only got up to turning point three because when we got to turning point four, it had just gone over like three minutes. And normally we would have played on a little bit, but because the gaps between rounds were only 15 minutes, we had to call it there. But in turning point three, because I had wiped out that flank, I couldn't still control his objective because he, he basically had a sister on one wound because of the medic. And I'd already killed the medic, but she just wouldn't die. So I couldn't, I like, you shoot and then like two hit and then keep rolling for up saves. So what I did was just drop my plant signal beacon. So I had to do it while within red of his drop zone. I used the comms guy to give my grenadier who had gone up the right flank. So at the last, my last activation, I dropped that and I'll go like, I minus one APL'd that operative as well. So even going, if we went into turning point four, if he tried to move up, charge and whatever, he didn't have the APO to pop that uh, objective marker. So that was 2VP to me. I'd already marked enemy movements and we were tied. I think I took the lead. No, we, we were tied and tied for primaries because we hold the same amount of objectives because you get two VP, you get one VP for holding two or more objectives and then you get one for holding more and then one for holding each one in enemy, your enemy controls. So because we just controlled three each, uh, we got free VP from primary every turn. Uh, and then my opponent got free from his tac ops and I got four from my tac ops because I maxed out mark enemy movements and I got max from plant signal beacon because all you have to do is drop it for two AP. And so I won it by one, super close. Although I think if we did go on, I would have just wiped him out because he only had three options left. I had six and I was in a position where I just rushed his point. So once one of his operatives had died, it would have just been a mop up. But Paolo played really well. He was using his faith points like perfectly. It was just, uh, I think he just committed a bit too early. And, but that was pretty much it. So it was a really fun game, but I managed to win 7-6 in the end. I'll just double check. Yeah, 7-6, because I managed to score one more tack up. So almost a, almost a draw. So I was like, whoa. Because, yeah, I mean, I hadn't gone to this tournament to win. I'd gone to see how well I could do with the Pathfinders. And because of my lack of training, I was just like, whatever happens, happens. So it was a really fun game, and I was glad to have played him. So for game two, this time I was up against Gorm. So th this is the thing about pairings. They started to change. So I was supposed to play, I think it was Warp Coven. And I was like, oh, no, the Warp Coven are back. And then I got to my table and then the pairings changed. So my table didn't change, but who I was playing changed and it changed the Gorm. And he was using Commandos, which I was like, oh dear, toughest matchup. Um, Cause it's like, and we were playing Master of the Terminals. So 
because I know how t commandos work, I was like, oh, if he get if he takes two dynamite, I've probably lost this. Uh, he he rolled off. We rolled off. He got the attacker. So obviously I was on the back foot again. I deployed first. So as you can see in the image, I deployed in the bottom left. I had bunched up, but that was on purpose. So because I got to deploy first, I got to drop my drone controller first. So I put my drone just under the building with the skull, because remember, there's no floors. So I put him under and he had perfectly blocked off that terrain piece because he, my opponent used forward deploy to put the breacher boy completely underneath that terrain piece in the top left. So he's in the corner where he's just unreachable. He has a dynamite and he only took two other smoke grenades. And then I think he took a climbing gear, but he didn't take two dynamites. He tried infiltrating his slasher boy and or the DACA boy within range of that building by free. But because of my drone, it pushed him because he had to be uh, more than wet red away. So six inches he had to he had to deploy basically eight inches away but then he was no longer within black, so one inch of the terrain piece. So I blocked off that terrain piece from his early advantageous deploy. And then we'd both picked infiltrate. He'd let me go, f uh, so then he went first. But then in the strategy phase, I used my recon sweep because I'd put everyone within red of my board edge, right? So what I did, I recon sweeped everyone up. So now no one was within range of being dynamited. And I completely denied that. And spoilers, I did it every turn, every strategy phase, just to in the next strategy phase as well, just to bait and mess up that dynamite because I know how damaging it could be. And effectively, turning point one, uh, he went to claim four, which was fine. So because I had uh, my free dash, I managed from the recon drone, the gun drone dashed up. So it was behind the wall and within the center, within two of the, within white of the objective three. So claim that. And then all he could do is claim two. So he moved his knob behind the building, but with his arm sticking out a bit, just around the corner. So I managed to dunk, dunk, sorry, five marker lights on him. So then I shot him with, uh, I think, a no my leader, or yeah, my leader, I managed to do uh, nine, six damage to him. So I knocked him down to seven wounds. Is that right? No, I knocked him down to nine. Sorry, knocked him down to nine. And then uh, he moved his rocket boy up and switched him to engage because he couldn't set up the turn one dynamite. And effectively, he rolled five hits, one crit, and I saved it all because I rolled a crit. So I only take I only took uh, splash damage around my leader. So my leader took damage and two of opters took one damage. And then Mark lighted that guy up just to kill him. So I killed his rocket boy. And then for my last activation on turning point one, I ran my ion rifle forward just so he could see the arm, shot the knob who had now six marker light tokens, and I rolled three crits and two hits, and he only made one save. So he took 21, no, 21, 21, 22 damage, something like that. And then, uh, yeah, he couldn't just scratch it. So turn one, he lost his knob and his rocket boy. And then turning point two, uh, I managed to claim three first, then one. Stopped off four because my attack ops were mark enemy movements, plant signal beacon, and also I think it was overrun. I think it was overrun. Something like that. Um, no, it wasn't overrun. It was something else. Mark enemy movements. Let me just double check my scores. Oh, no, that was it. Mark enemy movements, silent patient hunter. So score more of the primary while concealed. And then... Uh, yeah, plant signal beacon. So yeah, turning point two, I managed to massacre most of the boys. So uh, I shot by his boy on the point because he put a smoke grenade on objective four and turning point one. But the thing is, if you cross the line, you count as obs obscured. But my uh, interference pathfinder ignores that. And if I put four marker light tokens on someone, I ignore the smoke grenade. So I didn't really care too much. He managed to do the dynamite by giving the, him plus one APL from the comms but only could kill my marker drone and my leader. But I thought that was a fair trade because I only activated my marker drone and my leader. Couldn't do much up top. Oh, I forgot to mention turning point two, I did do Mont Car and I did that game one as well. I always did Mont Car because of that free dash that you get, which is so powerful. So I managed to mitigate uh, dynamites even more so I could space out more and I had more range. My Grenadier had... 
what do you call it? Fusion grenaded the Daka boy who had moved up and knocked him like for four wounds and then did it again in turning point two and killed him and then moved up. So then on turning point three, because turning point two, I killed most more, a lot more of the orcs. So there weren't many left. So turning point three, he was within red of the drop zone. So I was like turning point three. Uh, he, he won initiative, activated first, completely ignored the guy in the open. And I was like, cool, cool, cool. First activate, drop plant signal beacon. And he's like, ah, I can't get there. And I was like, yes. Uh, I managed to take control of point three. So I got one. Uh, so it didn't matter for three. Sorry. So he got four again. And then I got uh, objective two, which was mine in the bottom left. But the problem is because I killed everyone around his objective one, he was like, oh, you know, my DACA boy is going to run to my objective one because I can activate that. And before I did, because I'd already realized he was going to do that. So he's my interference guy to knock him down to uh, one APL. And he was like, oh, um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, he couldn't get to that point. Previously, he at the end of turning point two, he'd shot his grot around to my bottom left terrain piece at the oil pump where my sniper was because he was trying to do blow up for the next turn. So what I did uh, with the free dash was drop down and shoot, but only did, did free damage to it. So what I did at the first thing for turning point one, uh, turning point three, because yeah, so I won priority for turning point three. I no, he did. So no, what I did was I I used a worthy cause with the drone controller to move <laughs> to switch the the recon drone to conceal, to move red six inches, then analyze the grot, and then uh, <laughs> nominate my sniper who went to engage. And then rode two crits and two hits, so obliterated a one wound grot. But I thought he had interloper, which he didn't. And then basically, he only had three operatives left. But I already we were tied on the points. Once again, we just because of uh, the confusion with the round and setup. So with the fifteen minute break, we'd started effectively like ten minutes late. So then by the time we'd got into it, we'd only gone to round three again. Um, but this time, if it'd gone to round four, I would have. Wiped him out for sure and got on domination. Because what was it? I maxed out marked enemy, enemy movements. He had no way to stop plant signal beacon because I killed everyone who was remotely even near because of my brave, <laughs> crazy gun drone and then my interference specialist doing minus one APL on everyone who would try and go to objectives or get the movement to go there. And I'd gotten one for patient hunter because turn two I scored it. I couldn't score it turn, turn one because we've tied. And then, uh, what was it? Yeah, Plant Signal Beacon. So finally, the scores ended four on primary for me, three for my opponent. He scored no tech ops, I scored five. So it ended nine three to me. And if it went forward, I, I probably would have wiped him out and then just gotten two more on the primary. Because the weird thing about this mission anyway is you never score high for the primary unless you're dominating the game for the beginning. And when you're the defender, it's hard to claw back and take a re really big lead from the primary so yeah even if i had even if we had played another turn all i would have gotten was two maybe one or two so i would have ended on like six well i would have got i would have maxed out my tac ops as well so i would have been on 12 to 4 or something like that it wouldn't have been much because the thing is my f opponent had shock tactics which i uh, nullified by preventing him from killing anyone because everyone he tried to kill the medic was either supporting or was able to stop so he got unlucky there but it was still a really fun game and uh, probably my hardest game of the tournament just because I was like did not want to play commandos but really shocked and happy I was able to beat them because yeah I, I was it was just really tough um I forgot my opponent's name but he was playing Zinch well, he wasn't playing Zinch, he was playing Warp Coven. Because <laughs> it's funny, it's like, oh, you know, I might have to explain a few things to you because this kill team's quite complex. I was like, it's okay. I've played them more than I would have liked to. Um, but because we... This is the weird thing. So once again, our game was delayed a bit because they had to... Well, the T had to set up our board because I thought it was... I came during the end of lunch and I thought the board was set up, but it had to be reset up. And it was using the... Uh, Bad Moon terrain, which uh, was better than the previous Bad Moon terrain, because when we played at the first tournament, we had really big terrain pieces with lots of fire lanes, and the big terrain pieces basically stretched from one side of the board to the other, so you had one gigantic piece. So they'd split it up this time, but this was Block City. So as you can see, we have three silos, which are technically vantage points, 
a big piece of rock, which is also heavy, another container at the bottom, which is heavy, those two walls on either side, which are heavy, oddly a scramble piece of terrain, a light wall, a light crate, and then another light uh, barricade up on the top right. And we were playing Escalating Hostilities. So this was a mission I really liked because it's one of my favorite missions. It forces you to an eventual scrum in the middle. Um, but the board, oh my gosh. So the board was great for me. And technically my opponent would have had a great time if he wasn't playing against Tau. Well, Pathfinders to be, to be clear. But the problem is because of the basically big blocks and nowhere to hide inside terrain, it was perfect for me because I could just see pretty much everyone I wanted to and mark like what I went up with. So for TAC Ops, I went with Overrun, Plant Signal Beacon, and then also um, TAC Op Free for Pathfinders, which is just basically have more, more than half of your operatives engaged and kill more. Kill more than you lose. And basically, uh, he was the... I think... No, yeah, he made me the Defender. So obviously I picked the left hand side because I was like, you know what, it's it's more defensible and more punishing because the other problem with the tournament at Warhammer Ward, they were like, if a terrain piece is under an objective, you can move the terrain piece out of the way. But they at Bad Moon, it was more, no, you have to leave the terrain in place. So that's why the objectives look odd when they're like slightly under terrain pieces, which makes it really difficult to play around. And yeah, because of this. I mean, my opponent had three sorcerers, four Zangors, and a gunner. But the problem is he realized he couldn't engage up to me. So he, he moved a sorcerer up onto three concealed. Uh, and I got five marker lights on him. No, no, I got two. Then he moved a sorcerer up concealed between the rock and his container, which was his leader. And I got five marker light tokens on him. And uh, iron rifled him away. Once again, just like Iron Rifle went, because I could activate, because all my concealed, uh, so all my engaged operatives were effectively behind that container because they were effectively invisible unless he could somehow fly down the flank. Uh, I had one engaged Grenadier who was just bait, and effectively, yeah, I Markalighted one of his sorcerers to five, blew him up, Markalighted the other one to like four, and then heavily wounded him. Turning point two, I killed another sorcerer because turning point one i had moved up and used my fusion grenade to kill a zangor then his leader took the bait charged killed it and then dashed behind terrain um but effectively i managed to kill more than he could do and what i did because i didn't because i couldn't kill the his heavy gunner with the chain gun so all i kept doing was putting him on minus one apl because i put my interference operative interference pathfinder behind the scrap pile but still behind the heavy terrain so he was obscured by it and obscuring but obviously he ignores obscured so you could see everyone was going you're minus one apl and i'm going to like ping you up um, just like do some ping damage but effectively by the end of turning point by the start of turning point three because i went first i murdered all his sorcerers so he had no sorcerers left and turning point three he only had a Zangor and his chain gunner left. Uh, and I effectively managed to swarm and control the board because anytime he moved up, I was just able to gun someone down because the terrain was quite sparse. He couldn't hide properly. And even when he did try to hide, uh, I just mark lighted someone up. And yeah, it was it was pretty devastating. Like it started slow, but then once I'd waited for his guys to commit because he could activate he would get that overwatch first, but effectively, because his heavy gunner only had one APL for the entire game, he had to he actually had to use the heavy gunner to control points. Because he couldn't move and shoot, and he's, he realized shooting was a trap. And then, yeah, it was just using the heavy terrain because I could abuse it and he couldn't because I could be obscured and then mark light someone for four tokens and go, no, I can see them. So yeah, it was just basically ping damage, and I killed so many. Uh, he... He had this tack ops, which was like, I had to nominate two of my operatives and then nominate an objective and he had to kill them. But the the sorcerer he nominated to kill my operative, I killed him turning point one. And then the other sorcerer I killed and he just, he couldn't score anything. So he didn't score anything for his tack ops. Uh, I think he got two on the primary and I scored 18 because I maxed out everything. So 
yeah, it was a rough game. Like he he I think in the end he finished eighth overall and best warp coven player. But the problem is I knew what the warp coven did. And yeah, I was just being really aggressive with my recon drone and gun drone, using them as bait as well, using them to double fire with the drone controller, and it was just brutal. I think it was also the board. If we were playing on an Ectarius board, I think he would have been able to actually properly hide from me. But because of the blocks, yeah, there was there was really nothing you can do when you had to come and contest the points. So yeah, it was unfortunate for him. But yeah, I managed to win, and that was my game free. So going into the final round, I was one of the eight, no, one of the four undefeated players. And because of strength of schedule, originally I was like fifth or something, no, fourth, something like that. But then strength of schedule bumped me all the way up to first because of my strength of schedule, because I played the toughest people. But the thing is, I don't really agree with that because I wasn't able to, like, there were people ahead of me on more victory points they'd scored more tech ops than me they'd scored more primaries but they were like ranked lower and that's why i was confused because i was like these people have probably actually played managed to get like four turns as well and it's like they've scored more than me but now i'm ranked one so and i think they're doing pairings randomly i'm not sure how they were doing pairings and yeah so i ended up playing mark and his pathfinders so one thing I forgot to mention in the tournament prep is, uh, let me bring up the board. Oh my gosh, I forgot to take a picture of the board. That's really annoying. So I'll use the layout. So this was the weird thing. So on the layout, this the problem with this board is I like asymmetrical terrain where you get a slight advantage for deploying first. But if you can see already, you get a huge advantage for being the defender in this game because the way the tor the re uh, the way the placement of terrain is and the fact they don't move out of the way of objectives you had half of an objective blocked off by that terrain piece and because i was against tau as well i knew who if we were evenly matched i knew whoever won board roll off would win so then obviously i lose board roll off the immediate picks defender which is fine the only difference about this board image was even though it was an octarius board the two pieces of middle buildings were just crates, uh, like Ministorium crates, which were smaller and also blocks, so I couldn't hide inside them. And the scramble piece on his side was just some crates. So I said, that's just crates, that's not scramble. Like, if it was Ectarius, you could have brought the crates, I mean, brought the scramble pieces. So that was interesting but then when he started putting his barricades around the building to shield the point to make it basically impossible for you to run and dash onto it i knew he was a good player and uh, it was going to be really hard for me to steal it so in going into it i was the attacker so i immediately did uh, what do you call it uh, a worthy cause to activate my gun drone because he deployed his gun drone first onto the point so i couldn't contest it but my gun drone was like seven inches away. So I switched to engage because I used infiltrate. And I was like, if I can kill this gun drone, I can then move on to the point and contest it. On like reflection, what I should have done was just charge the point and then just stay there. But I did something very stupid. So I shot him one, one hit, rerolled into two hits. And because I have relentless and then he saved one of them so he only took four damage and then i was like okay i'll charge so at least block up the point and then i stupidly remembered oh i can analyze use analyze i forgot that you can't analyze the gun drone um what i actually probably should have done was just uh use the recon not the recon drone sorry use the drone controller to analyze again on to well to use the gun drone again because even though it's hitting on fives then it would have cleared the point but i should have just charge locked or even just moved and claimed because i would have counted as two apl he would have counted as one and it just locked up that point but he let me take back the charge so i just moved next to it because i was an idiot <clears throat> and that kind of spiraled out of control because he started swarming the point but he also left two operatives in the open even though he thought they were behind terrain because i he plays a lot of tts apparently and i think that was his first day of full gaming with that kill team in real life 
So it was just very easy to go, well, if we're playing TTS, I think you would be concealed, but the way you've deployed them physically from attacking here, you're completely in the open. So basically managed to kill actually a lot of his operatives turning point one, but it, um, he had one in the middle on, a, on two on his left and I only had two on the right. And because of a play error on my part, I moved my leader out of range of the medic, so my leader got blown up. And effectively, as the game went on, we were actually trading in terms of kills, but I could never get on to the middle objective. So by the end of turning point three, we were I'd only scored three from the primary, he had scored six, but I was scoring more on my tack ops, whereas his were more not. Um, and I was slowly getting away at killing the left, but the problem is I had, I couldn't advance up the bottom flank because it was just a crate. But I was also, my tack ops were mark enemy movements, patient hunter, and plant signal beacon. So yeah, going into turning point four, because I'd moved up, it, I managed to clear the center point, and then I just immediately moved my drone with my drone controller, my recon drone, onto the middle point, claimed it, and secured that. I had tied up another operative by charge blocking with my marker drone, and then, yeah, effectively failed to kill anyone, lost an operative. My sniper had run forwards down the bottom flank and had managed to stay alive, and because he only took four damage, he managed to do plant signal beacon and score me two tackle points from there. I'd already uh, maxed out my mark. No, uh, I scored one from mark enemy to, uh, movements and one from Patient Hunter. And then it came down to, because I'd been scoring um, three from the primary until the final turn, which I scored four, uh, scored two, sorry. Um, so one per turn and then two in the final, whereas he'd done the reverse. So he was on seven from the primary, but he'd only done two from, three from his tack ops. He would have gotten a fourth because he tried to vantage, but we were unsure if you could use the leader's spectrum analyzer on himself to do a mission action for free because we're not sure if you're visible within yourself. We asked the TO and the TO said no. So because he had one more tack up point than me, because I had only managed to get three tack up points and I didn't... No, uh, no, I managed to get four. Because I only got four tack up points, one from overrun, uh, one from mark enemy movements and then plant signal beacon. Yeah, I, I managed to, I think I lost, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, nine, eight. So I lost nine, eight, super close. And like Mark was really good opponent. Like, as I said, when your opponents are evenly matched, it comes down to who would win boards in that game. But I was really happy how I did in the mirror. Um, yeah, and it was just really fun. We both made mistakes, like positional mistakes and like wrong timings. But you know, it's bound to happen in round four of a very intense tournament and yeah that's how my final game went so yeah overall at the end originally i thought i finished fifth uh but then apparently because of mark's no because of the guy who came fourth with commandos one of his opponents he beat ended up losing his final game instead of winning and they incorrected uh, entered the wrong score incorrectly so because of strength of schedule i ended up finishing off because first and second was pathfinders then mark with his pathfinders then a guy using hunter clades and then me so because of strength of schedule even though i didn't have the highest uh, vps and stuff i ended up coming fourth with pathfinders which was great i mean i was really happy with the result overall because anyway i wasn't going planning to win especially after my first two rounds when i was like oh, i'd max out points or anything there's no way i'm going to win this uh, so I was just playing to see how far I could go and yeah doing pretty well with minimal practice but yeah after playing through with the pathfinders the thing I found most overpowered was a worthy cause because effectively even if my opponent was going first because I generally activated the drone controller I could do the drone controller into the recon who could then the recon could then analyze and activate another operative so even if my opponent was going first I was activating three operatives before they did or I was activating four before they could first activate, which was ridiculous. The only way it was really countered was when my opponent was also Pathfinders. We were just doing it before each other. So I don't think they really need that, especially at one CP. That was the most unfun thing, because naturally doing 
three operatives at once already is strong, but doing it always at the first start of every turning point was just crazy because it's not hard to be within white of an objective. If it was only triggering off of within blue of an enemy operative, I think that would be fine, or you couldn't use the the drone controller with it. Even then, it should be 2 CP, but that was the most overpowered part. The equipment being nice and cheap was great as well because it was really easy for me to get to five, well, four marker lights on someone so my gunners could just do, oh, you now have five so I can shoot you while you have concealed. But yeah, my MVPs, so for operatives, it has to be the interference pathfinder just because him dumping minus one APL on people from any range while ignoring obscured meant he just shot down operatives I couldn't kill. And it really like melee operatives with only two action points could only either charge or just like move away. They couldn't do anything. And then my tack op MVP was definitely plant signal beacon. So good, especially with the comms and able to just dunk it on a, on a flank. You know, you can't stop. It was just so good. But yeah, I definitely think I was helped by being able to pick my attack ops because if I had to pick them randomly, I don't think I would have done as well. And also, I have to thank Strength of Schedule because once again, Strength of Schedule pushed me all the way up to fourth place and even first place at the end of round three. Because as I said, I wasn't maxing out my score. It was just because of how I played tougher opponents, technically. But even then, it's like... You, you can say, well, it's showing you played harder games. I was like, eh, I still didn't win, though, and I didn't score enough points. So I don't feel like I should have placed as high. But that's that's the other thing. I mean, my biggest gripes with the tournament was they had someone shouting out round timings. But because that guy was playing at the tournament, he forgot to do it during the tournament because obviously he was playing. So he can't remember to shout out rounds when he's playing. And then also because we were doing four games within an hour and a half, of each other so there was an hour and a half for a round and 15 minute break i find the games are much better when it's an hour and 45 like at warhammer world because i think even the big spanish tournament did it as well because the general consensus were if we had 15 more minutes we would have been able to finish and have a full game as pretty much everyone else as well so hopefully going forward they either do because this tournament was on a sunday hopefully they do it on a saturday with four rounds or even just a sunday with three rounds and an hour and 45 each with like a half an hour break only having 15 minutes between rounds was really tough. Like, I think I had, like, a three-minute break, basically, between each each round, unless it was on uh, lunch. And the other thing is, I already mentioned it a bit uh, previously, but because of strength of schedule and then changing matchups, so people would play on their terrain, on their table, my matchups changed basically at least three times at the start of every round. So going into round four, I started 10 minutes late because I was setting up... I'd already waited because I was like, I'll wait, it changed and it changed. And I was supposed to be playing, I think, Warp Coven or something else again. And then when it changed, I was like, oh no, John, you're supposed to be on this table. I was like, oh no, BCP said I'm on here. And then I looked at BCP and I was like, so I'd spent 10 minutes setting up at the wrong table because they kept changing the pairings. But overall, outside of those gripes, uh, it was a lot better. And... Obviously, if you're looking for a kill team tournament or an in the London area, I'd highly recommend playing at Bad Moon. It's a nice venue. There was pizza on order at lunch. I had no time for that because there was not enough time between rounds. But there's pizza there, alcohol, water. It's a good gaming space, basically. And you won't have a bad time going there. Even despite my gripes I had, they were only minor ones. And it was still a really good event. And there were a lot of good people there. And it's just a really fun environment to play in. So despite there being a mix of like casual and competitive players, it was still really good. Although it's not as like the gold standard for me, which is Warhammer World, but that's because, you know, you've got multiple people running that. They've got an event pack. They've got the perfect terrain for it, so you don't have to bring your own. But it's still a really good alternative if you can't make it to Nottingham or you're in the London local area. So I'd highly recommend checking out if you can. As for me... I'll probably stick to playing Pathfinders for a bit until I win with them in a tournament. And then after that, I'll either go like Vet Guardsman or something else, or even like a Warp Coven, because I've just bought those to paint up. Because I'm more like, you know, I'll try and win with everything at least once and switch up. But it's just because I've got the Pathfinders painted. And I think with a little bit more practice, I'll be able to like iron out the mistakes I made. So, and also they are very, very strong at the moment. I still think Commandos are better because commandos are more flexible and more broken because of what the commandos can do with denying board space. But the Pathfinder is also really good as well. 
Uh, so not trying to undersell them. They are they're really, really good. But yeah, that's that's pretty much for me this time. Hope you enjoyed this battle. Well, tournament recap. Please remember to like and subscribe as well as comment what you thought and what you'd like to see in the future. I should be doing more bat reps soon, as well as another tactical video on a specific kill team coming up. And yeah, hopefully I'll be back into the reign of making videos more regularly now as like work starting to ease up a bit because my schedule has been crazy. That's why I haven't even been able to practice much. And also, yeah, I don't think I'll do an article with this one because what's slowing me down putting out videos is or putting out content is doing articles with videos because I stopped scripting because scripting was taking up a lot of time. And I found my videos are now doing better when I don't script, but I'll still do it for like you know, product reviews and stuff. But yeah, I really hope you enjoyed this battle report. Thanks for Charles as well for being my semi training, well, being my training partner and coming down to the tournament with me. He did pretty well as Admech. I think he was the best performing Admech player because the guy who came third place with Admech was using Hunter Clates. So Charles was doing really well as well. So yeah, and I'm also trying to get him to switch to Veteran Guardsman because I think he's kind of maxed out what he can do with Admech and I think he'd be really strong with Vet Guard. But yeah, that's it until next time. And remember, keep rolling crits even in the depths of the bad moon.